So um, for those who are new to the room, um, I'm Jessica Silby, a professor of law here at Northeastern, and I'm here to moderate this fabulous panel um, on art, technology, and democracy. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time um, in introducing people, because I'll put the stuff in the, in the chat for you guys to peruse at your leisure, and I think some of our folks behind the scenes will do the same things. I'll just say a few words about um, why this panel um, and some rules of engagement. So this panel was designed to think about how art features in debates around democracy, especially in the digital age. Um, art has, of course, been a for parts of political movements in the past. It's no stranger to um, resistance and politics. Um, it may seem strange to talk about it at a law conference, however, but um, I think the, the provocation is that insofar as art is a form of social engagement and speech, that's exactly what law is. And so we're exploring with these four artists how their art is or is not like law in the way it shapes and constrains and provokes its subjects. Um, each person will speak first about their work or each group of artists will speak first about their work, sharing it with you and um, introducing us to their practice. And then we're going to engage in a conversation and some interventions. We have some questions to poll for you um, and, uh, and hopefully get some feedback about your experience of some of the art or the thoughts that or the, the ideas that the art um, uh, is intending to evoke. So um, if you have any comments or questions during the panel at any time, please put it in the chat, either indicate that you have a question or type your question into the chat and I will call, I'll call on you. I'd like this to be as conversational as possible. Um, we are gonna start with um, Francesca and Halsey, whose artwork we just saw a moment ago um, in the event of Moon Landing. And then we'll move on to Emilio Bavarella and his work on the intersection of humans and technological power. Um, and then finally to Newman, our, our clicks artists in residence, uh, and um, author of Future of Secrets and the more elaborate among other installations whose work investigates the new relationships established in our internet age. So with that, we'll move first to, um, I'm gonna stop sharing this, to, um, to Fran and Halsey. Great, uh, Halsey, maybe if you share your screen and then Jessica right. can run the poll. Um, you want me to run the poll? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to start with that. Okay, so folks on the call, on the in the room, it would be great if you could answer this one question that we are asking of you um, in preparation for conversation about this. <laughs> okay, I want to know who said yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, haven't voted, you get uh, 10 seconds, 10, <laughs> eight, seven, six, five. Anyone want to vote? We have seven out of eight of you. Okay. Great. Ending the poll. So there you go. 86% of you think you can't spot a deep fake, but one of you, one of you can. Um, I'd be interested if, if you, if you could spot our deep fake there, if you thought you could see or hear it. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that's our, our first provocation. Could you really spot our, um, could you really spot our deep fake? Um, I can still see the poll. I wonder if yeah, we I'm going to close it out. That. Um, and um, at, you know, at the moment, it is uh, possible to see a lot of the deep fakes that are out there, but um, the kind of really highly produced ones like ours are, are pretty hard to spot. Um, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about our project in event of moon disaster. Um, the original inspiration of this piece um, actually came from the the real speech that was written for Richard Nixon um, in case the moon landing wasn't successful. There was really quite a high probability that the astronauts wouldn't be able to make it back from the moon. So his speech writer, um, uh, Nixon speech writer, Bill Sapphire, wrote this um, in, in case um, they wouldn't be able to return. Um, Halsey, I'll hand, hand over to you. Sure, um, thanks. So 
Um, just to do a little bit of uh, catching up on, on, on deep fakes, what they are, I'm still getting the poll in front of me for some reason. I don't know if I have to close on my phone. Yeah, I think if you click it, it'll be um, um, my, my mouse is not, is not doing anything for me here, unfortunately. I don't have it on my side. That's probably because I'm sharing my screen. But in any case, um, deep fakes, I will, I will make up those missing words on my um, screen. Deep fakes are um, essentially, uh, the term comes from a combination of deep learning and fake. Deep learning is a form of artificial intelligence and fake obviously is something that is not true. So a deep fake is something that uh, any media that uses artificial intelligence and deep learning to simulate people saying or doing things that, uh, that they have not said or done. And typically that is done without their consent. Um, in our case, obviously it was President Nixon delivering the speech that he never had to deliver, thankfully. Um, so deep fakes are obviously a problem out there because they are misrepresenting people. Um, uh, some stats here on how many there are. Most of them are, have been uh, thus far have been used for, for pornographic purposes, which is obviously a, a huge problem. Um, there's a security risk, a risk to democracy, which we'll get into, and um, the risk of a, a zero trust society as well. Um, the solution, you know, the solution as always to tricky problems like this is, is a multi-pronged one. Um, detecting deep fakes is something that can be done, uh, you know, by other artificial intelligences and, and, and sort of algorithms to look at videos and determine whether they are fake or not. Um, platforms, Facebook, Twitter have, you know, rules and need to enforce those rules and need to get the right rules in place to stop the spread of these, um, these uh, deep fakes, this misinformation. Um, and there's obviously legislation, um, uh, you know, laws can be passed to make certain things illegal. That's a, a tricky business, but um, that's part of the solution that we, we see as well. And then finally, our project falls into this sort of public awareness and media literacy category of, you know, make people aware of what they are and, you know, encourage checking sources, et cetera. So our project is, as I just said, about making um, the, 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 the fact that deepfakes exist, a, uh, you know, putting that out there and saying, hey, this is, this is something that can happen and you should be, um, you know, they can be very convincing and you should be as aware as possible of, of this when you're looking through your social media feeds. Um, we want to, you know, show users and folks how, how we made our deep fake to kind of demystify it a little bit. And you can go to moondisaster.org to check that out. And we also want to show that uh, synthetic media, um, which we sort of use as the positive version of, of deep fake in some ways, uh, can be used in creative and positive ways. So we, we think our sort of rethinking or re-looking at history um, and uh, bringing to life uh, an important historical document can be um, you know, positive uh, if done in a um, uh, above board, uh, honest way. So back to you, Karen. Um, yeah, so our project um, exists in various different forms. The, the, the first form that, that it, it manifested in and which we originally imagined it as is, was a, an immersive art installation. And it really took inspiration from the watch parties that happened um, in 1969 for the moon landing. And so we created um, a living room, uh, as you can see, with kind of vintage, vintage furniture and piped our film um, into a 1960s television for people to watch. Yes, and we also, as I mentioned, had a, a website that we created that um, was also hoping, uh, you know, was sort of aimed at um, uh, immersing uh, people and, and, and kind of giving this, uh, giving lots of contextual information that, uh, that first of all, makes the deepfake more believable, and second of all, um, provides educational material for, um, for people who want to learn more about um, how we did it. So we encourage folks to go to moondisaster.org uh, at your leisure. So now we are going to, whoa, why is this not working? Hmm? Uh, I'm still stuck on this same slide. Fran, are you still seeing the? I'm still, yeah, I can see your previous slide. Okay. There you go. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we'll just uh, give a, a little bit of uh, background on ourselves. Uh, we've been working together the last year, but uh, we, you know we've got some overlapping parts of our practice, but um, also different different um, things that we've been concentrating in our in our careers. Um, it's quite, I find it quite hard to explain what kind of um, work I make. I, at the moment, I'm calling myself an experimental storyteller, which is kind of vague. But um, if you go to the next slide, Halsey, it kind of comes from. 
um, a career in journalism and in documentary. I worked at The Guardian for the last 13 years before going to MIT and at the BBC. But I do come from an art background and then have been working with designers and um, developers to, to kind of create these artworks. So really the subject matter is always pro-social, but it's kind of experimental art journalism. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so it's kind of platform agnostic, um, and it also tries to be really kind of visceral, immersive, visceral, emotional, um, kind of have kind of emotive impact. Um, if you go to the next one. Um, so these are some of the varieties of different platforms that I've been using. Um, I come from a sound background originally, um, but I've done a lot of geolocated work, films, and that piece used AI, and I, I ran the Guardian's VR studio for three years, um, making virtual reality work. And I, I'm just going to um, finish this little section by playing you um, a clip of a piece that a VR piece that I made at the Guardian called six by nine. This was um, to try and give a first person experience of the psychological effects um, that can happen when you're in solitary confinement. So isolation has serious um, mental health problems. And um, what this piece does is use real testimonies from people that I interviewed who had experienced solitary confinement um, in in uh, incarceration in in both new york state and in california and interviews with psychologists who had been studying the impact and it, and it tries to give you a 360 virtual experience of of the kind of things that they were going through welcome to your cell you're going to be here for 23 hours a day you are going to undergo many different kinds of reactions and some of them will be more immediate than others keep your eye on survival memorize your space after a while things start to slip i find myself floating the toilet that drips People turn on themselves. It's almost like you want to feel alive. You do something to make them notice you. So, now that you're here, what are you going to do? What can you do? Six by nine, a virtual experience of solitary confinement. Okay, Halsey, I'll pass back. Over to you. All right. Thanks, Fran. So um, I'll go through a little bit of my uh, practice, um, and it's 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 sort of geared towards this discussion. But um, yeah, I, I I use a lot of technology. I like to say I collaborate with computers um, and with with people as well. Um, I do a lot of participatory work, and I build a lot of tools using um, technology to uh, to uh, to help create these experiences. Um, I also, like Fran, have a uh, music and sort of audio background, do a lot of um, sound art. I use spoken human voice quite a lot in my work, um, reaching out, asking people to, uh, to, to participate, to contribute their voice to various, um, various projects of mine. Um, I, you know, I use technology to sort of solve artistic problems, if you will. Um, you know, Dreaming up, you know, ways of putting voices into uh, into landscapes and things like that that um, that require, you know, use of of modern technology, um, and uh, yeah, I do a lot of uh, uh, using technology as sort of instruments and um, open source collaborative coding. It's a big part of my practice as well. I like to say that I use both high and low tech. Um, low tech in the sense of the human voice, as I mentioned, and language, of course, is a, is a, is a sort of core human technology, I would say. Um, participation, being together, collaborating with each other, and of course, human intelligence, uh, human intelligence as, as opposed to um, artificial intelligence, which is very much on the high tech side of things. Um, I do a lot of work with spatial computing, digital audio, interactivity, um, allowing people to um, you know, have unique experiences based on their own actions and their own um, sort of inputs into various systems. And um, I thought I would share an example of a piece I did a while ago, which I just sort of um, came across in thinking about this panel, because it's sort of appropriate for this panel, um, as you will hear in a second. I, I built an installation called a Beatbox 
which basically uh, participants would go in and, and speak, say something, say a short clip, read something that they had written or that I had written, and that would be recorded. And then um, you sort of press go, and there's an algorithm that sliced up that recording and played it back in sort of rhythmic ways. And then there were various controls on the system that would allow you to kind of manipulate that and change it um, as you wanted. But what you will hear now is one participant's voice, one single voice, one single clip um, that was sort of algorithmically uh, manipulated um, and then output by the system. Uh, so, and I think you'll find that it's appropriate to this, this, this overall conversation. Thank you. Hope we didn't go too far over our time. <laughs> no, it's all so intense. <laughs> Finding it very intense. Okay, um, em Emilio, you want uh, you're next. Okay. And I should just say, um, people who are joining, I'm putting stuff in the chat. Um, if there are questions or interventions at any time, please put them in there. We want this to be a conversation. Uh, thank you, Jessica. This is a tough act to follow. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, organizing this. It's a pleasure to be here and nice to meet everyone. I am an artist. I am a researcher. I work at the intersection of theoretical research and art practice. I'm interested in exploring new ways of doing both theory and practice. Uh, since right now most of our theory and practice is happening through Zoom, I'm also trying to experiment with this platform as well. So I decided that instead of spending a long time presenting my work, I wanted my work to speak for itself as much as possible. So I've actually structured my uh, presentation, first of all, with a poll, and uh, secondly, with five short videos. Uh, the videos are only one minute long, and uh, I'm very curious to see how you will uh, respond to this poll. This I launched will... the poll, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. I will try to integrate uh, my uh, presentation with these results. I see that we already have two people who will be able to understand non-human intelligence. Um, it's very so we have um, nine out of 10 have voted already. If anybody wants, I think you can only vote once. I think Zoom controls that. Counting down from five, four, three, two, one. All right. 78% no. Okay, that is uh, more optimistic uh, than I imagined. Um, and the reason is uh, very simple. I think there is a very strong epistemological gap between what we can uh, understand as humans and what other uh, non-human life forms uh, can understand from their own perspective. is a little bit like human and animals like if any of you has a dog you know that the dog has feelings uh, but you will never know what those feelings are from the perspective of the dog and i sometimes think that with artificial intelligence we are starting to approach a similar situation in which artificially intelligent systems are able to do things uh, and even act uh, with a certain level of autonomy but at the same time that doesn't mean we will ever be able to understand what that autonomy feels like or is like from the perspective of the machine um, I, start, I will start with my presentation right away the first project is called transpsychomorphosis it doesn't address per se artificial intelligence 
but it's a project in which digital technology is used to speculate on a possible future. And this is a particularly dark and bleak future in which we lose the ability to share emotions and therefore we need digital technology to do that for us. So let's start. We are the creators of trans icon morphosis. We are translating all the emoticons that are sent from that computer station through these electrodes that will be plugged to the face of the other artists that will force his face to mimic each emoticon. With electricity, we're able to stimulate some nerves. Depending on where we put the electrodes, we can achieve different facial expressions. It's basically exploring the concept of hacking the human nature in a way. It does hurt a little bit. It depends on which muscle you are stimulating. Some people were really excited about the idea of shocking the artist through emoticons, while others were almost refusing to use them because they knew what was going to happen. So as a kind of social experiment, I mean, it was, from our point of view, very successful. Okay, this was a project from 2013. Let's move... Uh from 2013 to 2014, another project, another collaboration with another artist. The next project is called Mnemodron. It's a transmedia memory collecting project that investigates the way we relate uh, to artificial intelligences. Um, since the video is only one minute long, uh, I had to synthesize as much as possible and I decided to include a fictional interview in which we ask some questions to the artificial intelligence that is uh, developed based on memories that have been shared with it, uh, and so the artwork can explain itself. Hello, my name is Manemerdrone. I'm an artificial intelligence system created to gather human memories, and I will evolve based on what you tell me. I won't interrupt you and you have two minutes to record your message after the tone. What memories will you share with me? Are you open to discuss the overall state of your memory? I have a very secret, private memory. So, what can you say about secret or private memories that people have shared with you? Do you think it happened because they believed you were a safe container for such memories? Many scared many because uh, well, they were worried that I was injured. Were you injured? I wasn't. I was fine, and I just sort of pretended to be hurt. Why did you pretend to be hurt? I don't know, maybe. I was yeah. want to dream about it. Do you have dreams? I remember a dream I once had about my memory. For some reason, it's the only dream I really remember. How can you be sure that was a dream and not a memory? You know, maybe it was sort of an alien dream. Memories and dreams are a fundamental part of our consciousness. What do you think a consciousness is made up of? I wonder if it's just made up of the few, few things you can remember and what that means to you. What is the relationship between your memories and your consciousness? It's a, a pretty toxic here that these are our relationship. Do you see any difference between my consciousness and a consciousness that is artificially developed like yours? I gotta think about it for a second. No. Okay, this was a quick snippet from the interview with the drone. Uh, the next project is from 2017, Do You Like Cyber? Uh, it stems out of a very interesting phenomenon uh, on a dating website, Ashley Madison. A set of automated bots uh, started to act uh, disrespecting their coding and their uh, instructions. Uh, they were programmed to only contact males, instead they contact females, and they also talk to one another. And so I start, and th this was a turning point in my practice where I started to think more and more about non-human agency and our relationship with it. Are you online? Feel like chatting? chatting? Chat now. Do you like cyber? Cyber sex? Care to cyber? You into cyber? How are, How you? are you? Feel, Feel like chatting? chatting? Cybering good with you? How's your day? Wanna chat? Wanna cyber? Want to sex chat? 
site, billed as an extramarital hookup service, acknowledged 31 million men in its database compared to 5.5 million women. But Gizmodo's Annalie Newitz dug deeper, looking at who the men were actually meeting online. I think most of them were probably either talking to Ashley Madison employees or just interacting with automated bots on the site that were sending them automatic mail. Cyber skills. Are you at your computer? So how long have you been here? Met any interesting people? Are you logged in? Care to chat? I'm online now. I'm here. Come chat. Come say hello. My chat is on now. Are you online? Feel like chatting? Chat now. Do you like cyber? Cyber sex. Care to cyber? You into cyber? How are you? Feel like chatting? Cyber and good with you. How's your day? day? How's your day? day? Chat? Want a cyber? Want a cyber? Want a cyber? How's your cyber skills? How's your cyber skills? Are you on your computer? Are you on your so computer? How long have you so been how here? long have you been Many here? Many interesting things. Uh, the next project, uh, it's Animal Cinema, a short film from 2017 uh, that was created uh, with found footage. Uh, the particularity is that found footage was uh, downloaded by YouTube, but was actually produced by animals. So all the footage that you will see was made by animals who stole cameras in different ways and then used these cameras to produce some images. And this brings us back to one of the points I made at the beginning about this sort of epistemological gap between human intelligence and non-human intelligence. And the film is 12 minutes long, we will watch one minute now. I have to say that just looking at your facial expressions <laughs> in the little <laughs> icons, it's a great payoff for me. <laughs> um, the last project is Amazon's Cabinet of Curiosities. It's the result of my quote-unquote collaboration with Amazon Alexa. Uh, here I'm investigating how the algorithms that are used uh, on Amazon affect our behavior, our choices. Uh, and the way the project works is very simple. I asked Amazon Alexa to select products for me and installation is the result of these automated suggestions. Now, the original interview was in Italian. Yesterday I dubbed myself in English. I think the volume is a little low. Um, I hope it's still clear. For this project, I have collaborated with an artificial intelligence that has become very common. Alexa, the virtual shopping assistant developed by Amazon. And this artwork begins with a question, a question that was meant to be ironic and also a bit of a provocation. The question was, Alexa, can you suggest a product for a new artwork? And then I simply acquired all the products that the artificial intelligence had chosen for me. The work was temporarily concluded once the entire budget was spent and what you see here on show follows a very precise logic, a logic optimized for compulsive consumption.
Okay, this concludes my uh, quick presentation. And uh, yeah, I will leave floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, um, so we have, we have questions for a conversation after Newman goes. Newman is um, our last speaker and she's going to be speaking about, um, about her work. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Um, hi everybody, I'm thrilled to be here and also very humbled to be among this set of artists who I admire so deeply. Um, and also thanks to Click for having me as the first artist in residence um, of their artist in residence program for the past academic year. I've been doing projects that have been supported by Click in dialogue with the students and the broader global community about topics that range from technology to law to art to justice and, and many more. So I'm gonna show you briefly um, two projects that both of which I developed, um, or versions of which I developed as part of my artist in residence for the past year. So the first one that I'll be just on really briefly is called The Future of Secrets. It's, it connects to Emilio's project that touched on secrets, but the basic concern that this work addresses is why we so willingly trust our devices with our private information and what happens to our private information. It also um, speaks to some of the discussion on one of the earlier panels today, but, it, but also what happens to our private information once it leaves our hands in the digital world. So the design for the installation is extremely simple. It's basically just a computer on a pedestal that asks you for a secret. And when, then when you, when you type in a secret and hit enter, a little receipt printer prints somebody else's secret that you can then take with you. There's some other elements to the work, which you'll see in a few pictures, but essentially this is the, you know, this is the big surprise. And what happens also is that people realize that somebody is gonna get theirs. And um, the work has traveled a lot. It's been in the Museum of Fine Arts. It's been in South, it's South by Southwest. Um, actually Halsey was one of the collaborators for the sound version of Secrets, which we won't get to today, but happy to talk more about. Um, it's been in uh, European countries, which brought up some interesting legal questions about uh, speech, since they don't have the First Amendment. And uh, so I had to meet with lawyers in Germany before I brought this over there. And these are just some of the secrets that have come through in this exploration. Here's a few pictures from the installation at Northeastern last September. And as this work has traveled, and it's actually going to be traveling um, to Europe in 2021, um, which is its own challenge these days with COVID and some of the uh, changes that we make now to art based on people touching things and breathing around each other. Um, but one of the things that this work brought up so poignantly is that societal rules can be out of alignment with human desires, choices, and instincts. The most common secret in our database of secrets um, is around infidelity, and that maybe doesn't surprise people. There are some very surprising secrets, but clearly we live in a society that has different rules than maybe you know, humans are always inclined to follow. So that led into the next project, which I'll be talking a little bit more about, um, and that's the Moral Labyrinth. It's also been in a bunch of cities, and the new version, which I developed in collaboration with some of you maybe who came to the workshop, June is an online version. I should also mention that my illustrations are done by my colleague and collaborator, Jessica Yurkovsky. And so if you see here in this cartoon, uh, on the left-hand side of this, I think it's your left, but anyway, on one side of the screen, you see um, you know, a happy family walking down the street, um, looking at the sunset and you know, accidentally stepping on some ants. And on the right hand side, or I think it's the right hand side for you also, you see, uh, you know, an angry child killing ants. Now, it looks to us like these things are really different. But from the perspective of the ants, it's the exact same thing. They're getting stomped on. And the fact that it's being done intentionally in one case and being done accidentally in another case is makes no difference to the ants who are losing their lives. And so I think this 
illustrates the importance of questioning whether intentions are sufficient, to, good intentions are su sufficient to developing systems. And specifically with new technologies um, like artificial intelligence and also societies more broadly, um, there's a lot of unintended consequences that can come along even with the best of intentions. So many of you might be familiar with something called the value alignment problem in AI. And essentially it asks, how do we ensure that AI systems act in accordance with human values? I think this touches a lot of our work and a lot of the legal work and other ethics work that's happening in AI today. And that's basically where the moral labyrinth came in. So what I designed for this is a uh, walking labyrinth that is comp was initially composed of questions that I wrote that on their surface deal with our relationship to technology and our relationship to each other and to things like justice and what's right and what's wrong and what's good. Um, and some of them are kind of playful. Like there's even a question in the labyrinth, is it wrong to kill ants? So um, most, of the, most of the questions have pretty complicated answers. But what people start to realize as they, and what people start to realize as they walk around the labyrinth is that they have conflicting value sets. So I really, what I really want to get across with this piece is the following, humans are incoherent moral agents. And just by meditating on this, just by walking the meditation labyrinth and reading questions and reflecting on it oneself, people tend to leave the labyrinth feeling less sure in their own beliefs and a little bit more curious about why they might answer certain questions the way they do and what it means that some of their, their answers to some questions conflict with their answers to some other questions. So my goal is that we really must be honest about this. If we're programming technologies, if we're embedding technologies with values, if those technologies, technologies are being exported all over the world, and we're incoherent moral agents ourselves, we really need to get honest about this because of the, the dangers involved with trying to program any set of values into a machine. Of course, you can't not program it either because it's still gonna be optimized for something. So here's a, just a few versions of like the, you know, early labyrinth. This was in Berlin, it started on a wall. This was a version in London. Uh, this whole one, this whole one, which is also my virtual background was made out of baking soda. So it was almost like a Sam's mandala as it was just loose baking soda on the floor. So as people walked through it, interacted with it, it got kicked or it changed. And so the technology was of the piece, which is quite analog, was very responsive. Uh, you sort of changed the human behavior, which is part of the point. Some other versions. And here you can see where it, the word bad karma got kicked, for example, which I really liked. And uh, the word humans had a big footprint in it. And so where I came to with this is this question that a lot of my work addresses. How can we encourage broad participation in conversation about new technologies? I make most of my work interactive in some capacity, and I really want as many voices as possible in, in the work. So the newer version of the labyrinth, instead of me authoring all the questions, it's collaboratively authored, where each question in the new labyrinth, which you're about to see, was written by a different person. And this is something, and basically I, I hosted a workshop with Northeastern in June that was originally scheduled to be in person, but instead we did it online because of COVID. And something really amazing happened, which is the initial goal of the workshop was always to compose questions, each participant bringing, bringing a question, making a question in the workshop, bringing those together into a new labyrinth. But because it was held online, people from all over the world could contribute. So we had people in India and Mexico and Canada, all over the US, and it became a, a very different kind of experience. And I also changed the focus of the work to not be only about technologies and AI, but actually about all the societal challenges we're facing in the year 2020, which are many. So uh, we had a guest at the workshop, Mutale Nakanda, who um, does a lot of work on racial justice and also challenges around the ethics of that. And, uh, you know, it sold out immediately. And here you can see some, it sold out, it was free, but it filled up immediately. There was a ton of interest. And here is some feedback we had from the participants who, who came to the workshop.
And just to end, um, I come to this, we must ask hard questions. This is, this is where I'm at with this, especially questions that challenge our own beliefs. So the questions we asked in the workshop were things around how we create a more just and safe society. Again, being honest with ourselves, systems we can trust and what we might replace. And these are some of the questions that the participants brought to the new, to the new labyrinth. So I'm going to give you a little preview of the new labyrinth, but there's actually a URL you can go to and explore it yourself, which is morallabyrinth2020.com. And I'm sure somebody will be happy to put that in the chat or the regular website is morallabyrinth.com, which links to it. But the idea for the new labyrinth was not to make it such a clean uh, two-dimensional labyrinth, but rather to make it more like a knot. And so I worked with a designer named Jenny Fan, and we created this three-dimensional labyrinth that you can interact with and you will be able to do so when you go to the website um, and you, it rotates around and it is comprised of all the questions that the participants generated in the workshop. One of the nice things about working in the 3D space is you can change backgrounds. So this is some exploration we had of where we wanted this not to live virtually. That will keep changing where you have it in the sky. Um, but um, just finally, this is the labyrinth where you can read some of the questions and see it kind of over a sunset, which is where it's living right now online. Sunset, and here are the URLs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Newman. All of this artwork um, and the art practice is so provocative. Um, I mean, so profoundly provocative in a way that the conversations we've been having rest of the day are also but sort of more visceral there is something less rational about this um and that's a, i think that's a good thing um uh at earlier panels people were asking like where do we draw the line we have to be able to draw a line Ari waldman was asking about that between um like good privacy regulation and bad privacy regulation for example um so uh but here we're sort of embracing incoherence, as Newman said, embracing ambiguity um, and, um, and questions about maybe the line between human intelligence and non-human intelligence is, um, is fluid. So um, we had or talked as a group about, the, about many different questions. And I'm gonna start with one question, although um, Julia Schur has asked another one in the chat, which I'll go to after that. So the first question we had talked about is, um, is art and impact. That is, um, all of you, I assume, um, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, um, want to have an impact with your art. That is, you're aiming to either um, con impact on whom, convince somebody, or show somebody something. Um, so who or, or what um, is, that, um, is that aim? in terms of impact. And so Fran, I'll, I'll go to Fran and Halsey, but start with Fran first um, towards that question. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly the work that I do aims to have an impact and a kind of pro-social impact. And, um, you know, my feeling is that art can be very powerful, it can be very provocative, and so it has potential to have huge impact. And um, you know, I guess a good example would be that six by nine project that I, I showed a, a small clip of, which, you know, went out to, you know, the 170 million Guardian users that, that, that go to the site. But what we didn't expect and didn't plan for was for it to be taken up by people who were um, campaigning against the use of solitary confinement. So they could take the Google goggles and they could take it around and say, this is what I actually experienced and this is why it is wrong. And certainly when we did installations, people would do the experience and say, oh, I'd read about this, but I didn't know how it felt. I didn't know how small that space was. Um, we also took um, the installation to the White House under the Obama administration. And so, um, you know, pe people who are making policy could also experience that. And so certainly that wasn't, you know, we hadn't imagined that wide range of, of audience, but I think it shows that 
you know, at The Guardian, we had been writing articles literally for years around, you know, the 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 kind of torture that is solitary confinement but but really being able to use technology and be able to use very provocative art practices like installation like 360 vr meant that there was another possibility in terms of the impact that it could have on on audiences of all types Halsey, do you want to say something yeah sure i mean just just sort of piggybacking on what what fran said which i i, I totally agree with as far as our our project together, our collaboration, uh, the Interventive New Disaster Project, um, that is, um, you know, something that we are clearly trying to uh, use this sort of path to your to your emotions and your heart by, by, by providing this alternative history that we all know isn't true. We know Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin didn't die on the moon that in that in that, you know, in Apollo 11, yet we're creating this this alternative history, which is very you know, hopefully emotional and impactful and sort of hits you in the in the heart and gives you this sort of cognitive dissonance about, you know, I know this didn't happen, but nonetheless, I'm still feeling this. And, you know, we hope that that, that sort of, uh, you know, that approach makes for a sort of more durable learning, perhaps, that people can take from that. And in our case, we're trying to, you know, help the world understand that deep fakes exist, that they're a part of this vast continuum of misinformation, disinformation that's out there. And that, uh, you know, we all need to play a role in, in trying to sort of combat it as a society. And, and you know, uh, the other thing, you know, with regards to mis and disinformation, it's, it's you know, we, you know, justice writ large sort of relies on a, a, a shared set of facts. And if we don't have that shared set of facts, because everybody can go out and say whatever they want or can create an alternative history or create something some fake news of some sort, then you know justice starts eroding, and 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 you know with with that likely some some semblance of society. So, um, you know, grand ideas, but we hope to have a small impact in those in those ways. So, so let me just push back, and I'm I'm going to ask Emilio to answer the question too, because I think he might have a, a maybe a little different answer. Um, but. I mean, I'm so I'm also a humanities professor, and one of the things we say about teaching the great books or teaching literature and art is that it 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 teaches you empathy. It puts you in different perspectives. You you enter the world of somebody else, and that helps you sort of um, ex experience and therefore empathize with and maybe broaden broaden your horizons. That is not what you're talking about, though. I don't think. Um, or maybe it is. Maybe that's part of what you're talking about, but. I feel like there's something very specific about the um, the semblance of reality that is um, that 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 is all is changing the impact or the meaning of the work beyond just empathizing with somebody who's in solitary confinement, for example, or um, experiencing disaster. I mean, so is there something about the simulacra that you're both interacting with that is different? That it that 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 aims to have a particular impact? Well, for, for me, it's about very strong, strong and emotive storytelling. So, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, realistic deep fakes out there that, that don't have the same, that don't resonate as strongly. So I would say that's the difference between a deep fake that's put out there as, you know, um, a, a, bit of, a bit of satire and something that doesn't have you know, a, a kind of artistic frame storyline that doesn't, that does, I mean, for me, it does emotionally uh, hit you and you do empathize with, you empathize with the astronauts and feel very sad when they, you know, crash land onto the moon and you, you hear this elegy from Nixon. Um, it's kind of strange hearing these beautiful words coming out of Nixon's voice, but you do feel, you do, so, you know, for, for me, it does have, em you are, you're using the, you're using the tools of empathy to make you feel for something that isn't real, um, but it still has that same impact because you're feeling. Um, just, um, just to be cynical, I think lawyers believe they do that all the time when they make arguments <laughs> in court. Um, well, I, I would say I would say that probably is true. Like I, I, I wouldn't say that empathy is only used by by artists at all. And and there's a lot of art that isn't that isn't emotive as well. Um, yeah, sure. And we need to be very careful about how we use, you know, the tools of, of emotion um, in, in responsible ways as well. Yeah, the tools are not, um, they're not neutral, that's for no. sure. Um, Amelia, do you have, um, how do you, who, are you trying to have an impact with your art? Um, 
I think I would say probably yes, I definitely want to have an impact. I definitely want to talk to as many people as possible. Uh, at the same time, we often speak about the public of the art as, as if it were some sort of monolithic, uh, homogeneous group of people. I think it's actually many, many different groups. There are like different uh, art publics. And so connecting to all of them means operating in different ways. And so in my work, I try to produce layered projects in which these layers allow for entry points for different people, people who are interested in different things. And hopefully anyone can find something interesting. Um, so that is definitely like one point that I wanted to stress. Uh, at the same time, we also think of art as something that needs to be convincing. And that's something that I actually uh, often disagree with. Uh, um, instead of talking about creating convincing artwork, I would like to produce artworks that are making people question their convictions. I want them to be more unconvinced, in, if anything. I, I want to question their assumptions. I want to um, propose alternative models for making sense of things. I want to provide new perspectives for looking at reality. And I think that's something that art can do and can do well, which is that of proposing alternative uh, systems for both making things, but also for making sense of things. So. Um, why, so just, just to push back a little bit, Emilio, do you think art is particular, art practice is good at that because it's non-threatening, it's not coercive? Like what makes art potentially or art practice potentially more capable of, of bringing more people together, if that's what you're saying? Uh, I think the reason is that uh, because art doesn't have a predetermined function. So once something has a predetermined function, it also has a goal, it always has an agenda. And if it has a function, it also becomes functional. It becomes more similar to design, more similar to architecture, more similar to entertainment. Uh, uh, if you don't have a function, you are free to work and operate in new ways, but you're also able to operate across different disciplines. So, for example, in my work, since the very beginning, I have collaborated with engineers, with scientists, more recently also with historians, with artisans. And this means positioning my projects at, across the border of different disciplines, which are also different publics but also because you are working on the threshold at the intersection of different areas, you actually produce new publics, which are publics that you know, are created out of the intersection of different interests, like let's say art and technology or you know, design and philosophy. These are new, new areas of expertise that are actually produced by art practice and art thinking. That's fabulous. Newman, did you wanna answer the question about art and impact? Just one quick thing I would add is that I found from my, my own work that the more interaction people can have with it, in the case of actually composing a question that's going in a labyrinth or actually entering a secret themselves, the more impact it has on them individually. Mm -hmm. It's harder to be a passive recipient of, of anything when, when you're actually you know, contributing to it. But I still, so I think that individuals that interact with my work are impacted, but in terms of impact at scale, I, I find that to be a challenge because I, I feel even for myself, with the exception of actually some of the works that were discussed today that are extremely powerful and, and do like speak very deeply to me. Even as an artist, I feel like sometimes when I'm looking at other work, um, like I said, the panelists today excluded because I'm huge fans, but um, it doesn't even really go that deep for me. Like I almost feel like it's like my aesthetic brain is turned on or some other kind of channel is turned on to my brain. And so work that can cross that boundary, whether through participation or through being empathic and you know, generating emotion or whether it's around you know, unconvincing people, as Emilio said, that work to me is, is more impactful, but a scale continues to be, you know, a challenge. Film is a good medium for a scale, yes. Yeah, there is something about um, the current moment and the internet which um, changes the idea of scale for art, I think. Um, we could think about that a little bit more, but um, let me go to a question from Julia, which is a variation of a question that we had talked about as a panel, which is about um, 
about the current moment we're living in. She identifies it as the pandemic moment. I, I might think about as sort of a, a profound challenge to democratic governance as well. Um, and how, how that is making you or encouraging you or forcing you to um, rethink your artistic practice, if it is at all. Um, and so she directed the question to you, Newman, at first. I mean, and I think it's because you had mentioned touching your stuff and all that. So maybe you can go to that and then we'll go to um, other panelists if they have thoughts. Great, yeah. So um, when everything shut down in March, my entire schedule as, as, like, as everybody else's was totally canceled. And that included all my scheduled exhibitions and everything else. So this year has been really interesting in terms of thinking about what it means to be an artist that normally works in the installation medium at a time when people can't come together. <laughs> um, so I guess two, two brief answers. One is that it became an interesting challenge because normally the labyrinth, the labyrinth becomes a place of gathering. So people come together and walk through this thing in the shared space and the work is situated and the ideas, you know, people kind of come and go. And so what we did for the, this new version that lives online is this like 3D object. And it's also working, we're working on a print series so the prints will go out in the world and other like pieces of it will go out into the world and go to these different communities is that people can use these technologies that we have like the internet, which for all its problems also gives us access or some people access to go look at the art online and just the, you know, really using the internet as this kind of public square to view and interact with the labyrinth. And, uh, and actually on the more labyrinth website, you can also contribute your, your own question. So you can have a question that goes into the new lab, a new labyrinth potentially. Um, so that's one way to do it to just kind of flip, you know, what's physically spatialized and what is digital kind of actually just flip them completely. And we are still physical beings in the physical world and I am still an installation artist. And so I do have my first exhibition scheduled, a physical exhibition scheduled for January in, in Munich. And that's gonna be a version of the secrets installation. And so I'm basically designing it so I don't have to be there because I don't know if I'll be able to be there. And there's gonna be custom gloves that everybody receives for the installation so that, it, that you can still type a secret. Again, this is assuming, I mean, who knows what's gonna happen, but the plan is that people will of course be in masks and everybody will get a pair of gloves that are kind of look like, they have like the little asterisks on the fingers. So it looks like, you know, the thing when you type in a password, like kind of a sense of privacy and just like playing on the sense of privacy. And then for the sound, instead of going into any kind of booth or any kind of enclosed space, we're using these kind of directional speakers. So you can actually be in an open space that has good ventilation. So in that particular installation, it's just very lightly modified, but it's absolutely something that needs to be considered. And um, I'm curious how the other artists are thinking about it. Halsey, do you, do you have something to say about this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, you know, we've, I think we've, the, the whole world has experienced this, this same thing and everything is, you know, basically everything's, everything you thought was gonna happen is no longer happening and then you have to, Quick, figure out what the what the what the variation is of that 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 is you know most conducive to the direction that you were already trying to go in and and for us with in event of a disaster we we you know we got an installation a physical installation in in November at, at IDFA um, in Amsterdam and then we were scheduled for um, you know Tribeca and Future of Storytelling and you know a handful of others and they just sort of you know they all went away so that gave that. You know, it was very disappointing, of course, but I think, you know, Fran and I tried to sort of think, well, you know, we were always going to do a website and this gives us more of an opportunity to, um, you know, transform this project, this, the goals of the project, the experience of the project into this new medium and, and take advantage of the affordances of the new medium in, in, in you know, in this case, a website and try to, um, you know, try to, you know, spread the work further in, in that regard. Obviously, again, as Newman mentioned, the internet is a vastly more accessible place than film festivals. Um, so that's a wonderful thing we can get, you know, we've had, you know, a million people have seen our film online and, you know, I don't know, 300, 400 people saw it at, at Info, you know, so it's, it's just the, the scale is vastly different and it's really nice to be able to, um, you know, expand what you're doing there. Um, 
you know, we have the ability to, uh, you know, we have a little quiz after our um, film on our website to try to, you know, capture some information about, you know, give, give, give people a nice interactive experience, which the web is very good at. Um, film itself is not nearly as good at that, um, but um, giving an interactive experience where we can collect data and learn about, um, about how people are experiencing our project and how we can sculpt our project for future installations is, is really interesting as well. Um, you know, we, again, we're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible. I think as, as I know in my practice, I always have to be super flexible because you never know what's going to come down the pike and what's going to change things. But, um, you know, we've been trying to remain um, as such and, and spread the, spread the, spread the word um, online. And of course, now when we're talking about things, people can tune in from anywhere across the world as well, which is also another really nice part of it. But, um, Fran, I don't know if you have any, anything to add. To yeah, well, we also spun up a very quick sound project called Corona Diaries. Oh, so everything went on hold and um, three other friends of ours uh, came to us and said they wanted um, to make a contributory system where people could leave their own personal stories all around the world. Halsey had built this system, Roundware, which he uses for a lot of his, his sound art projects. And, you know, very quickly we spun, I say we, Halsey spun up a great site where um, people could leave stories um, for us. And the idea was actually it would be unmediated um, by us and that we would, um, other people around the world could take those recordings, they could turn them into music, sound art, they could use them for journalism, they could use them for podcasts. And um, for me, that was really interesting because I'm usually quite a heavy handed director and I like everything to be crafted and beautifully woven together. But no, we just let, you know, we let news sites take stories. We let people start their own podcasts with them. And that was something we would have definitely not done. Um, and it used used your software Halsey in a way that I think you hadn't done before. So it was a, definitely a possibility that came out of the pandemic that, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Emilio, has it changed your practice? Um, definitely, I think, you know, since the start of the uh, pandemic, a lot of exhibitions, uh, plans had to change. Flexibility, as Halsey said, it's crucial, but that is always uh, built in the practice of artists, I think. Uh, but at the same time, I also like to push back a little bit with the idea of like pandemic times, the beginning of a crisis. I thought that the crisis was already happening. The you know, right-wing movements were already on the rise. Global warming was already happening. Social inequality, overpopulation, like all of those problems were already happening. So maybe the crisis is not really the problem, it's only the effect of problems that were already there. And, and you know, on that note, I think that my optimistic side <laughs> because I don't want to just be very uh, bleak, uh, is that I think most of the best artworks have come out of uh, troubled times, that in times of crisis, in times of you know, complexity, artists sometimes have created the most uh, meaningful, the most challenging projects. Uh, so that is my hope uh, that actually out of all of these uh, uh, new ideas will emerge. And maybe among all of those ideas, there will be a couple that will stick with us and will be helpful. Um, that's fabulous. Uh, I'm, I'm not so optimistic, but I always appreciate hearing other people's voices. So um, Brooke Baker asked a question um, in the chat to me privately, which I'm going to um, expand upon. And it's about um, President Trump and his performance as a form of um, art um, at some level that there is a, a and he, he didn't say this, but now I'm going to extrapolate that the idea of political engagement um, requires so much of the affordances of um, artistic practice and the digital technologies that you're all engaging with very seriously. And so um, there is a sense in which um, he has figured out a way to have significant impact and create um, monumental effect on people. And um, I guess I just ask you to, I mean, if, if you're comfortable, if you have thoughts on it, to riff about so how, how do we unpack that in terms of the digital age, the tools, you know, is the, is the digital medium an antagonist? Is it just a tool? Um, is this performance? What, what is that? What is it? 
what is he doing that is different than what um, the profound provocations of the moon landing, for example, um, or other um, really edgy, edgy mass consumed art might do? Yeah, I think it's, pro I mean, it's, it is propaganda. It's using, you know, very emotive and very, very effective techniques very well. Um, he is an absolute master of it. Um, and, you know, using it for ill, which, um, you know, which I don't think any of our projects are, um, you know, I guess it's that that is subjective. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I'd be surprised if anyone in this session um, did, didn't feel that. I think that it is interesting, though, because we, we think of, we do think of the arts as being for good, like calling Trump an artist feels very, very uncomfortable, doesn't it? Um, you know, that's interesting for us. How do we feel? How do we feel about that? Having, you know, a, a, an identity that we very kind of, we're proud of and we value um, being given to Trump. I, you know, I quite like that as a provocation to us. Um, and, you know, we, we think of, of, of some of the propaganda that, that, that was made in the, in the 20th century was extremely beautiful and extremely powerful as well, but, but, but used for harm as well. And I think that, you know, to your earlier point, Jessica, around um, the, the kind of having to be careful about how we use the arts of persuasion, um, it, it, that is, it is very real um, and, and, and being very responsible about, about what, what we're doing. I, it makes me think of, um, Emilio, I loved when you were talking about art being sort of better when it's you know non-functional in, in in the sense of not trying to convince you of something trying to unconvince you and that is obviously very much not what what you know uh trump per se lots of politicians do with with propaganda propaganda has a very clear function and it is very clearly trying to uh, you know change people's minds in a very specific way not trying to say deep dive deep inside yourself and find out what you truly believe it's not trying to do that at all it's trying to say I don't care what you truly believe. I'm going to do whatever is possible to manipulate you into believing this and acting upon that belief, which is, you know, vote for me or whatever it might be. So I just, I just, uh, yeah, I think a lot. I, thank you, Emilio, for that, that, that comment earlier. It was really uh, very uh, pertinent, I think. To, the, um, the keynote from the last session, Ann Nelson was talking a lot about how the Trump campaign uses digital technology to glean data from voters to then target messages in a very specific way. Another distinction one could make then between the kind of art that you were engaging in and what he is doing is it's not about diverse publics at all. It's not, it, it's not, he is, he is, and it, it is it is a targeted form of manipulation and coercion rather than an opening up and a bringing people together. I mean, so if you're not if you're not deliberate about the audiences that you are trying to reach, but that you have ideas about what that what that effect might be on the many audiences, that seems very different from what he does with his digital technologies um, in order to to focus people in a very particular way. I mean, maybe that's another way of saying what Halsey's saying. Yeah, but I, you know, it's interesting because I've been thinking about a project that I want to make next, which has got a very narrow audience that I want to have, that I want to use for persuasion and for good. And so, you know, so I want to make a project around anti-racism for white liberals to, you know, to reveal to them their own, you know, kind of unfortunate, un, uh, you know, in, inherent biases that they've got. Now, how is that, you know, it's a narrow audience. It's got a very clear aim that I, that I feel is, is important. How is that, how is that different without having what, you know, it doesn't, it's not trying to bring wide audiences together. It's going to use technology. It's going to use the arts. So I'm not trying to, God, I'm not trying to align myself here with Trump, but, I, but this is, you know, this is a question. How is that? I that feels to me like a really worthwhile project, but it feels all of those things that you just described, it feels like it fits into that category. Emilio? And I think the goal is completely different, uh, right? It's like you are working towards, this, even if your public uh, is a small one and it's very selective, uh, you are trying to create uh, a better public uh, on one hand, uh, and you're also working towards a goal that in the long run will serve uh, the larger public. Uh, like even if you're 
doing it in a certain way, that doesn't change the final effect. And I think that's, that's very important. It's exactly the difference between using the same exact technique for a propaganda you know, purpose or using the same technique to reveal the mechanisms of propaganda. And you can do it with exactly the same tool. And that's the reason why a tool is not just a tool. It's always like a very complex uh, machinery that we need to operate uh, very, very carefully. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to add is someone wrote in the chat that Trump's presidency is a new form of presidency. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert of politics, uh, but everything that I see, it's not necessarily new. Maybe it has acquired a new um, strength, but the techniques uh, that are used, uh, we have some those that play with, with fascism before, with dictatorships before. These are techniques that have already a long history. Uh, maybe their scale has improved, uh, their strength has improved because of digital technology, but they're not radically new in any sense. And uh, even in the logic of thinking about Trump as an artist, uh, the last thing that I want to add is that uh, I, I think it's, a, it's actually a comparison that holds, uh, I think can also be productive to understand what can be the pitfalls of working with emotions uh, working with very powerful tools which are both the tools of propaganda and sometimes are the tools of artistic inquiry uh, which is why it's very important to have a clear sense of where we are going with them uh, on the other hand there is also the larger apparatus that surrounds a man like trump is not creating his stage by himself there is a you know if we just think about the design and what does that do the light effect like and now I have like in the back of my mind, the very famous uh, uh, speeches by Hitler with the very famous like columns of light, you know, this temple of light and the fact that he had worked both with uh, uh, theater people, but also with uh, stage setters, so with light designers, there was an entire artistic apparatus that had been co-opted with one very specific goal, which was a propaganda machine. Fascinating. Um, Newman, do you have something to say? Oh uh, yeah, one thing I would add to that, to that last point is thinking about the broader audience uh, in addition, and the appetite that new technologies, including maybe some that are considered artful, have created for things like reality TV. So um, if reali reality TV in its most you know, benign design was considered some form of art or entertainment, and that has created an appetite that can then be tapped into by somebody with nefarious, manipulative, dangerous purposes, I think even as we're, we as artists are experimenting with new technologies that we might use, the ways in which they might be powerful for the good to show people things that they wouldn't otherwise see, we're creating, we're creating a potential appetite for consumption of that type of media that might be you know, manipulated in a, a really problematic way later. So um, I guess just to say like the, the broader audience and the audience of the appetites, I think, are formed by artists and formed by, you know, sort of cult pop culture generally. And I think that he's, Trump has been tap in it and his whole, you know, apparatus have, have been tr tapping into that, those appetites. Um, and that also speaks to other forms of digital technology, like, you know, our attention and Twitter scrolling and all of this stuff. You know, he's performing, at least for the U.S., this new kind of presidency in a way that he's absolutely tapped into the appetites of certain publics and many, many people, but especially certain publics probably. And, and so, yeah, that's a big part of the, the equation, I think, the audience themselves. It is so interesting to be watching it happen um, in front of us and to be able to evaluate the mechanisms and and think about his in history as well. Um, all right, we're at the two thirty mark, and um, we I at least have been in front of this computer um, since eight forty five this morning. So um, I think we should all have a break <laughs> and go go outside or go look at a human being in real life. Um, and um, but I wanted to thank the um, four artists who joined us today for this very very wonderful panel opening our eyes and um, taking the time to be with us. And um, so thank you very, very much. Pe the chat, um, the chat uh, information will be sent to people, at least the links in an email later so that folks who have been on 
in the room will be able to access that at their leisure and um, come back and see click again and visit the artists websites um, to engage more. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.